Hello, I'm Robert Egby and I'd like to share some notes on my new historical novel For the Love of Rose. It's about two teenagers, Frank and Jake Barbary. They're sons of a dairy farmer in Three Mile Bay in upstate New York. And one of the things about the boys was that back then they used to love the trains, the locomotives. At least eight trains, some of them sleeping cars, would haul thousands of New York City residents um, on their way to Cape Vincent and other places to take the cooler air in the summer. The boys had a, a favorite watering pond right under the old stone railway bridge here, just down the track here. And one day in the spring of 1936, their father suggested they take the horses for a dip in Three Mile Creek, which is right by the old stone bridge. It was an event that would change their lives, and I'd like to share with you some of Chapter 5. Moments later, they were racing across the meadow through the late afternoon sunshine. Cows nonchalantly raised their heads to watch the youngsters riding bareback, clinging to their steeds as they galloped up the grassy hillock toward the railway embankment. Like many creeks, this one was flanked by luscious growths of birch and willow, along with bushes all now in full leaf with the passing of spring. Frank arrived at the clump of trees and bushes surrounding the stone bridge. A narrow pathway curved round the hillside. I'm first, Frank shouted above the sounds of the galloping horses and their heavy snorting. His knees clung tightly to the racing horse as he guided it along the pathway. Now he could see the pool, sparkling and inviting. Then the woman stood up. Frank's horse stopped to avoid collision. A moment later, Frank's yelling body with flailing arms was tossed head first over the startled woman into the waters of Three Mile Creek. Cautious, Jake had stopped his horse and dismounted, but as he did so, he was now knocked flying by Frank's terrified horse as it broke out and raced away to freedom, quickly followed by Jake's animal. For a few moments, it was sheer chaos and then everything came to a standstill. The action froze for perhaps ten seconds. For Jake, it seemed an eternity. Flat on his back, he struggled to sit up and stared around. There was Frank, totally wet, his bedraggled mop of fair hair hanging over his forehead, his shirt torn and clinging to his body. Forlorn and still suffering shock, he stood in the shallows, staring at the shaking woman. What in the blazes did you do that for? he blurted out. Do what? Stand up in front of a galloping horse. How should I know you were acting like Wild West cowboys? Frank wanted to speak, but he was now at a loss for words. The woman stood on the bank. This place with its gentle stream, its mellow pool framed by this old stone bridge, standing among the trees was totally idyllic. A place to behold, a joy to the higher senses, she said, waving an arm at the scene. That is, until you two hooligans suddenly descended, totally invited. Uninvited? cried Frank, scrambling up the muddy bank and standing beside the woman. This is our watering hole. Watering hole, snapped the young woman. How crude. This is an oasis, a place for meditation, a sacred land where one can talk to the Creator, the spirit of the cosmos. Frank's indignation burned inside. Desperately, he wanted to shout, Nuts! Stop blowing your wig! Which were the current slang words at Lyme High School, but something deep inside advised him to stop. Hi, my name's Frank, he said. Frank Barbary, and there's my kid brother, Jake. Well, I really don't know if I should be pleased to make your acquaintance, came the voice now softening, but I will throw caution to the wind. A slender white hand reached out and together they shook hands. I'm Rose, Rose Marie Gerard. As you can see, she said, while her delicate hand reached forward and extracted a strand of river weed from his hair, I am an artist. 
I enjoy oils best, but when traveling, it's watercolors and pencils. It was at that moment a picture became embedded in Frank's mind. It was an image that would stay and haunt his mind for the rest of his life. A young woman wearing a white, wide-brimmed Tuscan hat with silky black hair tied into a top-knot bun that accented the strong but delicate features of this woman. Frank's eyes scanned the slim, trim body that lurked teasingly beneath the loose white cotton dress and the black leather walking boots. Her sharp, dark eyes stared back, cognizant of the fact she was being scanned, even evaluated. Evaluated? That was too strong a word. Frank was simply bathing in this beam of stunning sunlight that had suddenly come into his life. For Frank and Rose, 1936 was an idyllic time, and their love grew stronger by the day. By year's end, Rose and her father, a New York surgeon, had both become lost in Spain, which was embroiled in a violent civil war. Frank, totally innocent and naive, volunteered to hunt for them. Three months later, the 18-year-old was a changed man. He found himself in Durango, the capital of the Basque Country, on that Wednesday, March the 31st, 1937, the day the Condor Legion bombed it for no good reason.